Tonight, a murder on the subway with no apparent motive leaves transit riders in Canada's biggest city on edge. It's very scary. I just feel like Toronto's under siege. What we know about the suspect and the woman he's now accused of killing. The new artificial intelligence gaining popularity and raising eyebrows. You can have what seems alarmingly close to a human conversation with it. I was a little taken aback. And tracking a toxic culture in junior hockey. Do you think that the locker room has changed? Behind the scenes with two teams trying to do things differently. This is The National with Ian Hennemansi. A lot of anxious commuters in Canada's largest city tonight, the day after a shocking, deadly attack on a subway system taken by hundreds of thousands of people every weekday. Just over 24 hours ago, Vanessa Karpuska was taking the Toronto subway when she was stabbed to death. Police say the suspect was a complete stranger. Another woman was also stabbed. She survived. As Katie Nicholson shows us now, this is just the latest in a string of violent assaults this year that has riders on edge and the mayor calling for action. For transit riders in Toronto, an uneasy morning commute the day after a random deadly attack. It's very scary and when I set out this morning at about 8 o'clock, that's all I could think about. I just feel like Toronto's under siege these days. On Thursday afternoon, on a subway train at this transit station in the city's West End, Vanessa Karpuska was fatally stabbed. Police say by a stranger. A shock to friends who describe the 31-year-old as sweet and kind. We're all very sad. We are very sad today. Another woman was also injured. The accused, a 52-year-old, appeared in court Friday. He's charged with first-degree murder and attempted murder. It's the latest in a series of high-profile, violent attacks in the Toronto transit system. In April, a woman pushed another onto the subway tracks. The survivor is now suing the TTC for $1 million. And in June, a man doused a woman on a bus in a liquid before lighting her on fire. She died weeks later in hospital. The TTC remains a very safe system that moves millions of people every day safely. It's not clear what prompted the latest incident, but Toronto Mayor John Tory made a point of saying more needs to be done to support mental health issues across the city and the country. We are dropping the ball on this. We're dropping the ball collectively. Whatever the root cause, public transit advocates want more security for riders. What's needed is uh, beefing up you know, the, uh, the amount of people that are around. I'm, I mean, the people who are TTC, not the constables that are there to discipline people for, their, uh, for not paying their fares, but I mean the people that you know that wear the jackets. Katie, these are, as you say, high-profile attacks, but is there any data on, on whether assaults on the TTC are becoming more frequent? Yeah, the, the TTC does track what it calls security and safety offenses. That includes everything from assaults to thefts. And according to their latest report, uh, the number of these was much higher than it was pre-pandemic. But what's important to know is this is a transit system with one of the highest riderships per capita in North America. You can see 1.7 to 1.8 million trips a day. So while these are happening at a more frequent rate, they are still quite rare. Okay, Katie, thank you. You're welcome. Winnipeg's police chief maintains tonight he will not resign for his refusal to search a landfill for the remains of two murdered Indigenous women. First Nations leaders say leaving them there sends a painful and familiar message. But as Cameron McIntosh shows us, if a search does happen, it faces challenges. Operations in this landfill are paused as the question looms, what now? Police say they can't recover the remains of two murdered Indigenous women thought to be buried here. Politicians facing fierce blowback say they're looking at it. I'm not in a position to confirm what type of operation it would be if the search was conducted. The families of Morgan Harris and Mercedes Myron, along with Indigenous leaders, accuse police of racism for ruling out a search. And here you are, once again, creating unmarked graves of Indigenous peoples. We didn't have a starting point. Police say by the time they discovered the murders, a month's worth of garbage, including animal remains, were compacted and buried on top, with no records where the remains were dumped. 
So what we're left with is the potential task of searching for human re remains across a four acre site uh, that was 40 feet in depth. Landfills are probably the most difficult search. We put the details to this forensics expert who has advised on landfill searches across the U.S. The time passed, the volume of garbage, he says, would make it near impossible. I don't think the police had any other choice. Successful landfill searches, he says, are confined to small areas where dumping records exist. That's how this began. Police found the body of Rebecca Contois hours after it was dumped in a different landfill. The garbage truck had GPS. That investigation led police to the killings of Harris, Myron, and another woman. Jeremy Skabicki is facing four first-degree murder charges. As for the suggestion of a search now, seven months on, Gardner is blunt. You'd have to have an extremely uh, good circumstance. A decision on a search has not been made. Meanwhile, the chief of police is rejecting calls for his resignation, saying he'll see this case to trial. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. From waiting rooms in emergency to premier's offices across the country, worry is building tonight about the state of health care in Canada. Hospitals are overwhelmed as patients are being hit hard by a variety of illnesses. Now we're getting a new sense of the magnitude of one of them, influenza. The latest national flu numbers show nearly 1,000 children have been hospitalized so far this season, and that is way above average. Alberta is one province seeing widespread transmission. It's putting pressure on already stressed hospitals, and as Julia Wong shows us, it's leading to some terrifying moments for parents. Spencer Harvey now knows just how severe the flu can be. He was breathing really, really short, and then he was getting a very high heart rate, and then he was just overheating. So. He had to rush his 15-month-old son, Phoenix, to the hospital two weeks ago. The doctors that were working on him were discussing about whether they should resuscitate him as if his heart stopped. And, you know, as a parent, you never, you never want to hear that situation. Phoenix already has a heart condition. He got so sick, doctors decided he needed to be airlifted from Cold Lake to Edmonton. That's where Harvey learned what they were dealing with. I didn't realize uh, influenza could really hit that hard. Flu cases remain higher than usual across the country. And in Alberta, hospitalizations due to the virus are nearing what the province saw during the entire 2009 H1N1 pandemic. And there are still many months to go. Well, I've been practicing for a decade, a little over a decade, and this is the worst I've seen it in terms of pediatric viral illnesses. BC confirms six children have now died from the flu this fall. The province is opening drop-in clinics to boost vaccination numbers. We all need to do everything we can right now to try to um, slow down transmission, and I think that means trying to be more conservative about keeping kids home right now. There is some optimism, though. It appears right now that the uh, we have peaked in terms of uh, this current bout of flu. So I think it's going to take a few weeks for this strain on our hospitals to ease, even if indeed we have peaked in the community. Phoenix is now back home and recovering. Truly, truly grateful for how they treated my boy. They, they definitely saved his life. Doctors are stressing the importance of getting vaccinated, even if you've already had the flu, since there's typically another wave of influenza in the spring. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. And flu is just the latest virus taking a toll on Canada's strained healthcare system. Premiers are renewing their calls for more healthcare funding and face time from the federal government. Tom Perry now with their urgent calls to get a new deal. With the healthcare system in critical condition, Canada's premiers once again demanding Ottawa step up. What we're calling for today is just a meeting to sit down with the prime minister to have the discussion about a fair uh, and sustainable funding for the future of health care in our country. They met virtually to deliver a unified message. Set a date, we will put aside our whole schedule, all 13 premiers, to show up to Ottawa and sit down and let's hammer out a deal. But Ottawa and the premiers disagree on some fundamental points. Provinces and territories say the federal government covers just over 20% of health care costs. Ottawa says that ignores tax point transfers that push the federal contribution to roughly a third. 
The goal is to have a 50-50 funding partner. And with the transfer of tax points and the cash transfers, they believe that they're at 35%. Then it seems to me that we're about 10 to 15 percentage points off. The feds say they're open to more spending, but that the premiers shouldn't be crying poor. We look across Canada, uh, on average, provinces and territories are running surpluses, surpluses. So if it were dollars, it wouldn't be important to talk to the federal government. They would have all the, the dollars needed to invest in, in health care. Making it clear any new money will come with strings attached, another potential sticking point. A plan to send unconditional transfers to, health, to, to finance ministers is not a health plan. For now, there's no plan for the Prime Minister to meet with the Premiers, but the Federal Health Minister says he's been working with his provincial and territorial counterparts, and behind the scenes there is some common ground. Still, that can hardly be comforting for Canadians who are still facing long waits for care, and doctors and nurses who are overworked and exhausted. Tom Perry, CBC News, Ottawa. Health Canada has approved the first bivalent COVID booster shot for children in the 5 to 11 age group. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine targets the original virus strain plus the more recent BA4 and BA5 Omicron subvariants. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization recommends it be offered to children at a higher risk of severe illness at least six months after their primary series. Brittany Griner is back at home with her wife after a prisoner swap freed her from more than nine months of detention in Russia. Griner got off a plane in San Antonio, Texas, where she received medical attention. The two-time Olympic gold medal winning basketball star was sentenced to nine years in Russia after vape canisters were, with cannabis were found in her luggage. Russia's banning 200 more Canadians tonight in response to new sanctions imposed by Ottawa on Russian officials. Canada announced sanctions against nearly 70 people and nine entities in Russia, Iran, and Myanmar today. In a statement, Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie said, dignity, freedom, and justice are pillars of Canada's foreign affairs. The federal government has a new strategy to help the shift to cleaner technologies, but all those batteries, wind turbines, and solar panels need critical minerals. And as Olivia Stefanovic explains, getting them will be a challenge. It sounds counterintuitive, but the federal government believes mining is key to unlocking Canada's clean energy potential. There is no energy transition without critical minerals. The Natural Resources Minister says Ottawa is cutting red tape to get faster access to the key materials for batteries, solar panels and electric vehicles. But it cannot take us 12 to 15 years to open a new mine in this country, not if we want to achieve our climate goals. As much of the world transitions to cleaner energy, the World Bank expects a 500% increase in demand for these elements, lithium, graphite and copper by 2050. Even though Ottawa is spending almost $4 billion to speed up new project approvals, critics say the plan still lacks major investment. Some of the examples of you know, where these processes have dragged out actually have to do with with markets and, and companies just not being able to find the capital. Without these changes, there are concerns Canada will remain dependent on other countries and lag behind the United States. They're actually putting money directly in where they want to see results, including in Canada. But this Indigenous leader says consent cannot be rushed. They want to fast track everything. And yet they don't have the... Uh, the commitment to fast-track the, the needs of our people. His community is located in a part of Ontario that is rich in many sought-after minerals. The First Nation doesn't want it developed. We must have a say, we will have a say, and we will defend our rights. The pressure is on Canada to produce more raw materials for clean technology. The challenge will be how to achieve it without cutting environmental corners and respecting Indigenous rights. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Quebec's provincial MNAs are no longer required to swear an oath to the monarch before taking their seats in the legislature. Members passed a bill today making that oath optional. It then got royal assent. That means three Parti Québécois members who had been barred from sitting for refusing to swear the oath 
will now be allowed to do so. Let's turn to Atlanta, Canada, where people are still struggling to recover 10 weeks after Fiona smashed through the region. Homes and businesses are still damaged, livelihoods in jeopardy. And as Cape Canada shows us, many say they're still waiting for promised federal aid. Off the south shore of Prince Edward Island, mussel fishermen are still collecting gear, snapped and snarled by Fiona. Now it's expensive sea trash. Devastating. It uh, took away about, well, all of our equipment is gone in a pile out there. So it's have to rebuild right from the start. Jerry McDonald's gear is gone and most of his muscles are gone too. They were too young to harvest when Fiona hit in September. We're looking at maybe a 10% recovery of the muscles. $300 million in financial help is supposed to be coming from Ottawa. Yeah, I'm going to apply for it. Hopefully it gets something out of it. But when will the money come and how much will be available? Big unanswered questions making it tough to plan ahead. This Nova Scotia seafood plant ships crab and lobster around the world. It's the biggest employer in its seaside community. It's closed while it deals with millions of dollars in damage, paying for new equipment out of pocket. Its impact is in the fact that we're negotiating with our bank. We have to extend our lines of credit. There's an additional cost to that. Management says it's applied for relief funding and needs that money soon. It's desperate times and we need to get some answers from government. Don't make the announcement and then not follow up. Back on PEI, cottage owners also continued to pick up the pieces. Insurance aside, there's no fund for secondary homes. People are left then with, with giving up homes that potentially have been in their family for, for many, many decades. Ten weeks after the federal relief program was announced, storm victims say they're still not seeing results. In a statement, the government says that applications are open but cannot say when the money will start flowing. It's an added strain on Atlantic Canadians who are already dealing with catastrophe. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Halifax. New artificial intelligence technology is capturing imaginations with its ability to create human-like responses to almost anything you can think of. You can have what seems alarmingly close to a human conversation with it. Its implications for the future and why some are urging caution. Next. The Netflix series buzzing with palace injury. I had to do everything I could to protect my family. We look at the key takeaways so far with a seasoned royal watcher. And the well-kept secret behind this emotional family reunion. Happy birthday. <laughs> A big birthday surprise and some tears of joy. We're back in two. Former Minneapolis police officer Jay Alexander King has been sentenced again for his role in the death of George Floyd, this time to three and a half years in prison on a state charge of aiding and abetting second degree manslaughter. King is already serving a three year federal sentence for violating Floyd's civil rights. King kneeled on Floyd's back as Officer Derek Chauvin knelt on his neck for nine minutes, causing his death. As we mentioned earlier, the onslaught of severe respiratory infections is straining hospitals, and it's not just in Canada. The U.S. also struggling with an early flu surge combined with RSV and COVID. As Chris Reyes shows us, with the holidays approaching, there is concern about the next few weeks. This is the frightening scene in many hospitals across the U.S. Children in ICUs, emergency rooms at capacity. Imagine having 10 families check in to the ER every single hour for 24 hours. Public health experts blame a triple punch of COVID, the flu and RSV, or respiratory syncytial virus, spreading early and quickly across the country. According to Johns Hopkins, nearly 80% of U.S. ICUs are occupied as of the first week of December. While COVID numbers are nowhere near last year's peak levels, they are trending upwards. Nationwide, COVID hospitalizations are up almost 30% from two weeks ago. Flu hospitalizations are also on the rise, according to the CDC. I think the big thing is this is our first winter season that people have really backed off on a lot of the measures that we used to be taking as individuals. With most mask mandates and social distancing rules gone. Your president and I care about you and we want to make sure that you stay healthy. 
the White House is pleading with the public to get both the flu shot and an updated COVID booster ahead of holiday virus. gatherings. The virus out there today is very different. And so that's why we need an update, uh, updated vaccine because it targets the virus that's out there. <laughs> For some families, the message is hitting hard through experience. This is the worst flu season for my family ever. Some public health experts warn a return to masking could be possible. I think it's quite possible that we might get to a point that, oh, okay, we're going to have to bring these measures back at this point. Um, otherwise, we'll overwhelm the health system again. The reality, another season of vigilance for a pandemic-wary public. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. Now to a new artificial intelligence tool that's getting a lot of attention. It's being called the most advanced tech of its kind. Nisha Patel shows us how it works and its potential pitfalls. Ash Momo is testing out a new tech tool. Tell me a story about fairies and elephants. ChatGPT is an artificial intelligence prototype. Give it a task, and it pulls information from across the internet to create a solution. Momo advises businesses on innovation, so he's seen a lot of technology. You can have what seems alarmingly close to a human conversation with it. So I was a little taken aback. ChatGPT can write poems, college-level essays, computer code. It's better at some things than others. Since it debuted last week, more than a million users have signed up. People whose job it is to create those kinds of short texts that are maybe fictional or entertaining, those jobs could be at least augmented by ChatGPT. The tech could impact customer service, advertising and media in just a few years, though likely as a tool to enhance productivity. Technology tends to create jobs in unexpected areas as, as it takes jobs away. ChatGPT has captured the public's imagination because it's so easy to use. Using but this expert says it does have limitations. These systems don't have a way to distinguish true things from false things. That's a problem. While the bot has been programmed to avoid inappropriate tasks, like asking for advice about illegal activities, some biased or offensive requests still sneak through. It's sparking debate about when and how it should be used. One of the challenges with this is the technology just moves so quick and quicker than often legislative bodies can, um, you know, move. I asked ChatGBT, is the world ready for it? And use narration software to read out the answer. It is important for society to carefully consider these issues and develop a responsible approach to the use of AI technologies. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. The first three episodes of Harry and Meghan are out, and the new Netflix series is already creating a buzz. My mum did such a good job in trying to protect us. What it reveals so far about the couple's relationship, the paparazzi, and the racism they face. Plus, pushing back against hockey's toxic culture. The players and the coaches trying to change the game from within. All the things we were nervous about of it getting out. Okay, don't worry, it's fine. And then that very quickly changed. Prince Harry and Meghan talk about race, their families, and the paparazzi's relentless pursuit in a new Netflix series. Three episodes have been released. There are three more to come. So far, no bombshells like some of the Harry and Meghan's earlier interviews, but still there are some new insights. Well, let's chat about this series with Afia Hagen, a broadcaster and journalist in London. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. You have uh, watched those first three episodes really closely. And I, I know a lot of people who are, are looking at this newscast now probably haven't had that opportunity. So what would you tell them is, is kind of the most notable uh, part of, of those first three episodes? Well, there's a few uh, main takeaways, I think, first of all, that this is really about Harry and Meghan's love story. We get to learn a lot about how they met. Uh, they met on Instagram, which I think a lot of people didn't know. They uh, uh, Harry saw Meghan on a mutual friend's feed and they got in touch with each other. Um, and also about there's lots of pictures and videos of their life together. We get to hear Archie's voice for the very first time. Uh, we get to see Lilibet and Archie and see their family life, see their house in Monster 
Esposito. So it's really a lot about their love story. We also get to hear about the press and how the press have played a part in Harry's life from when he was younger. You know, he talks about never uh, remembering going on holiday without the paparazzi being there. And my mum did such a good job in trying to protect us. She took it upon herself to basically confront these people. Excuse me. As a parent, could I ask you to respect my children's space? And right up until now, until the, the part that the press have played, uh, whether it's uh, paparazzi hounding Meghan when she was in Toronto filming Suits, or the way that the press write about the couple. Uh, there was also um, some really great pieces on the effects of colonialism and the empire and the effects that that still has today. Two of the key themes in the, I watched the first two episodes, are, and you touched on this, uh, the paparazzi and, and racism in terms of the way that, uh, that Megan was, was covered in, in the UK. Both of those have been talked about before. Was there anything in that that surprised you this time around? No, there was nothing new, certainly, that we learned. But I think what we already knew was kind of fleshed out and was panned out. Um, so Harry talked about, uh, both Harry and Meghan talked about, actually, when uh, the story broke of them dating, but Meghan was still working on suits and how the paparazzi pursued her in Toronto. So I would say to the police, if any other woman in Toronto right now said to you, I have six grown men who are sleeping in their cars around my house and following me everywhere that I go and I feel scared, wouldn't you say that it was stalking? And they said, yes, but there's really nothing we can do because of who you're dating. There was a death threat and then she had to have increased security with the base of drivers and things like that. Um, and then also th talking about the press and the way the press wrote about Meghan when they figured out that she was biracial, the headlines seemed to turn. Very different to be a minority but not be treated as a minority right off the bat. But obviously now people are very aware of my race because they made it such an issue when I went to the UK, but before that, most people didn't treat me like a black woman. So that talk didn't have to happen for me. And it was kind of, you know, the it's it's the institutionalized racism, I think, in the British media and unconscious bias, you know, things that people don't even notice that are there and have been there for so long, contributed to those headlines, contributed to those stories and the way that they were written. As I watched it, I, I felt to myself that this is a, a carefully controlled message or set of messages approved by Harry and Meghan, uh, not, not a journalistic documentary done by somebody independently. If it had been that, are, are there parts of their story that, that you think would have been told or, or should have been told that aren't included in this? You're absolutely right in saying they have curated parts of their life that they want us to see. And yet, I guess if you wanted to have it more balanced, you perhaps would have other members of Harry's family there talking about uh, what it was like when perhaps Meghan joined the royal family, if you wanted that side. I think Harry and Meghan, when it comes to their life, they, they're telling us about their love story. The next three episodes are going to cover Megxit, their wedding, and, and what happens after that. They are good in certain ways at bearing all and bearing everything. I don't think there's anything perhaps that they have left out that we would want to know. But I think maybe if we did want uh, more of a journalistic side to it, then we would need to hear from Harry's family to, to see, to hear about how they embrace them, what it was like when they joined the family, the discussions over Megxit, the discussions over the roles for Harry and Meghan going forward, because there is two sides to every story. A few, three more episodes are going to drop on this. Uh, any idea what, what we might expect or, or what you hope to see in those remaining episodes? That's a really good question. We got a new 30-second teaser at the end of episode three, and it kind of points towards Megxit. It certainly points towards the press again. Uh, so I think we're going to hear about when they decided to leave the royal family, what happened after the wedding, what happened after the birth of Archie, and moving to America. Perhaps that's where the bombshells will be because there wasn't really any in episodes one, two, and three. So perhaps four, five, and six will up the ante. All right, Afia, really nice talking to you. Thanks. Thank you.
Still with the Royals, King Charles met Ryan Reynolds today. The two were in Wrexham, Wales at the football club co-owned by the Canadian actor. The King praised Reynolds and his business partner for bringing a lot of attention to the community. We have more head on the national, including a push to change hockey culture one player at a time. Everyone has a goal to reach just to become a better person and individual every day on and off the ice. Behind the scenes with the players and coaches trying to make a difference. Plus, a new project aims to protect Canada's caribou population with the help of traditional Indigenous knowledge. The World Junior Hockey Championships hit the ice later this month, but it comes at a moment of crisis for Hockey Canada, dealing with damaging allegations about how it handled sexual assault claims. The controversy has led some to take a second look at hockey culture and make a change. Karen Paul's got special access to players from the junior leagues for a look at the work underway behind the scenes. Do you get your 50 50? Yep. Across Canada. Good for you. Enjoy the game. At arenas like this one, junior hockey players are pursuing their college and NHL dreams. But they're doing it amidst a Hockey Canada scandal. Usually what goes in the locker room stays in the locker room. Hi. Hey. Uh, yeah, grab a spot. But these 19 and 20 year old players, Travis Hensrud, Davis Fry, and Dawson Milliken, have agreed to talk to me. You know, eyes on you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Everyone knows everyone. Yeah, it's a sensitive topic the alleged abusive and misogynistic behavior of some hockey players. So, my name's Brock McGillis. Um, I was a hockey player. I Brock McGillis is a gay former hockey player who's teaching young men about acceptance and respect and the damage of homophobic slurs. If the language I heard made me, you know, self-harm and try to die, imagine the impact that the language has or the bullying has on somebody who doesn't have all that I had going on. This is part of special training the Manitoba Junior Hockey League mandated for each one of its teams. Before you know it, it keeps spreading, keeps spreading, keeps spreading. Your entire team starts using it. All your friends start using it because you are influencers. How hard would it be for someone on a team like that to be able to push back and say, you know what, this is not right. We shouldn't be doing this. It takes a lot of guts for a guy to stand up, but when you do, that your voice is loud and other people will follow with what you say. It usually takes that one guy to speak up and create that culture of, listen, we're not going to do that. Do you think that the locker room has changed? I think when I was younger, there was obviously um, more of people didn't um, really care what they said. And now I think that we're older and know the consequences. Everyone has a goal to reach just to become a better person and individual every day on and off the ice. Guys hold each other accountable for what they do say and just treat everyone how you want to be treated basically. In the dressing room and in the community. That's your turn. Is that your serve or my? Tricky no mix. This is not just community service. We'll come here in December and um, do like a food hampers. It's meant to get players outside their insular hockey bubble pushing them out of their comfort zones. Head coach and GM Paul Dick took some time out from hockey to talk to us. I want to I just read a quote from the Minister of Sport. She said, a re-envisioned Hockey Canada must develop not only exceptional athletes, but also good citizens who respect women, the public, and the law. What are you doing here to achieve that goal? Yeah, well, I think respect is huge. When we have our initial meetings at the beginning of the season, it's a word that comes up uh, a lot, you know, having respect for one another in this room, first and foremost, and then for people in our community um, of, of different, you know, age and, and, and genders and race. And when they leave here to play in those big tournaments that they all hope to play in and that you've coached in, whose responsibility is it at that point to make sure that they're behaving and that they're good ambassadors for the sport and not hurting somebody? Yeah, for sure. In 2015 at the World Junior Champion 
uh, World Junior A Championships, our team won the gold medal. And after the fact, we knew there was going to be a celebration, but we also gave them parameter on, on what, what this tonight was going to look like for them. And, um, you know, who is going to be involved. We're in a community we do not know anyone. This should be a players only uh, event and um, where we checked in every so often. So, you know, the players, yes, they're 17, 18, 19, and you expect them to make good decisions and, and make the right ones, but um, that's, a, that's a collaborative effort. Who do you think, you know, is responsible for changing the toxic parts of the hockey culture? Because that's come under a lot of spotlight lately. Yeah, well, I think everybody needs to play a part in that role. I mean, uh, one, it's parents, and, and sometimes athletes have been... Um, not held, held accountable for their actions and uh, that starts at home often and but in, in in younger coaches as well and sometimes the better players when they say things well there's not accountability because he might score three goals for us that night and they can't be given any special treatment in my opinion the pistons aren't the only team dealing with these challenges Blue line center and then the far blue line. Okay, and hold same and side and then go. And hold, yeah. In British Pick Columbia, we meet end. Ian Devlin. Yeah. There you go, finish strong here, last one, hey, last one. Devlin is the captain of the BC Hockey League's Coquitlam Express. He wants to be a good role model to kids coming up through the system. You need a certain level of maturity to be able to deal um, with some of those uh, heavier conversations, but um, I'd say for sure um, by the years of you know, maybe 13, 14, as hockey really starts to ramp up and, um, you know, kids start to get more intense, you know, parents start to get more intense. The whole hockey world seems to really start, um, you know, closing in on you. They really need to forge, um, you know, a solid set of values and beliefs um, by that age because by the time you get to junior hockey when you're 16 years old, it's just an entirely different dynamic. In order to be a, you know, a good teammate, to be a good player, to be a good human being is, is following all these things, whether it be your character. Telly Campbell has seen the ugly being, side of hockey the from the bench that, as a coach. And the entitlement and, and you know, kind of the, the wrong things that were happening, the disrespect that some of the players would have for you know, uh, fans in the stands. Now, as one of the youngest GMs in the BCHL, he's tackling that from the front office. It really is like having 23 kids every single day. You know, you're always trying to manage the on ice part, you're trying to manage their academics because a lot of them are still in high school or getting ready for university. You're managing them being away from home, so a lot of homesickness. And you're managing a 16, 17 year old who's going through a maturity piece too, right? Um, and, and they're just trying to learn themselves as well through this whole process. And they can be used for learning through talks like this one. I think you have more influence on Canadian culture than NHL players. You're in every community in Manitoba. Adults worship you the same way as they do NHL players. So do little kids. Do you feel pressured by that or how does that make you feel? I think it's a good pressure to have. I mean, all the kids like ask for autographs after the game and it's kind of put a shift on my on view of things and knowing that like all these little kids look up to you and they pretty much think you're the NHL and um, a year their hometown team. I used to love my junior team. They were they're my heroes. I saw them being kind and doing good things. I would most likely pick up on that and be like, hey, those uh, are my heroes. I want to do good things. Hometown team, hometown heroes. The pressure of influence for bad and for good. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Steinbach, Manitoba. That training program organized by the Manitoba Junior Hockey League also includes anti-racism seminars focusing on Indigenous issues. Other leagues across Canada have similar programs hoping talk about changing the culture gets put into action. A new project in Alberta is aiming to incorporate traditional Indigenous knowledge into its caribou monitoring program. It's a special animal that uh, needs to be protected. Why well, some say it should be the future of conservation. Plus, the kicker was two of my sisters being there and that meant a lot to my dad. Three Newfoundland children bring tears of joy to their parents' eyes in our moment, but first. 
Remember this well-dressed little guy? Hard to believe it's been a decade since the IKEA monkey came into our lives. It was 2012 when a woman's pet named Darwin escaped from his crate before heading inside a Toronto IKEA. Decked out in a stylish winter jacket, out came the cameras and a star was born. So where is Darwin now, 10 years later? Well, shortly after the story broke, his owner was fined for having a prohibited animal and realizing she couldn't properly care for him, sent him to live in an animal sanctuary outside the city, where he still is to this day. We're told he's doing well, if not a bit shy. Happy anniversary to Darwin. A pair of thrilling matches today at the World Cup. First up, Croatia eliminated Brazil in penalty kicks. Then Argentina took out the Netherlands also in penalty kicks. Croatia and Argentina now heading to the semifinals. It was, by many accounts, one of soccer's most exciting days. And Alberta First Nation is combining traditional knowledge with modern technology to protect caribou. Here's Julia Wong with how it works and why it's so important. A remote pocket of northern Alberta, the Bistro Lake region has long been connected to the Deneta First Nation, but resource development has led to concerns about biodiversity loss, like the destruction of caribou habitats. Chief Wilfred Hokanusa says the First Nation traditionally hunted caribou for food, clothing and tools. That stopped several years ago because herd numbers had fallen. It's a special animal that uh, needs to be protected. It is triggered by motion. So the First Nation partnered with the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society to set up cameras to monitor the caribou. We need to understand uh, where the, the populations are spending their time. The cameras were placed using Indigenous knowledge about migration routes and where mothers take their calves. We've known uh, caribou for hundreds of years and it's been passed down verbally. And so all we need to do is to approach the elders and say, OK, where do we put the cameras? and they pointed to exactly where. The proof? Intimate caribou encounters, showing the population larger than other tracking methods have found. This is the Heritage Trail. An example, they say, of the impact traditional knowledge can have on conservation work. Information that uh, is available in traditional knowledge and, and Western science would not otherwise be known it had these two uh, knowledge systems uh, come together in this way. Both groups want the region to be designated an Indigenous protected area where the First Nation would play a lead role. We don't believe that we'll be able to halt and reverse the biodiversity crisis without the leadership of Indigenous nations across the country. Collaborations rooted in centuries of Indigenous experience with the aim to preserve this world for many years to come. Julia Wong, CBC News. Edmonton. Love this next story. This photo is an aftermath uh, of an emotional reunion. The Collins children decided to give their dad a terrific gift for his 60th birthday, traveling from Newfoundland to Florida. But here's the key it was a surprise. The moving video has been touching hearts online, and tonight the Collins family reunion party is our moment. Happy birthday! <laughs> Like most people, uh, me and two of my siblings feel like we have the best dad on the planet. He's the most supportive man. He's a sweetheart. And it's his 60th birthday coming up. They own a home down in Florida. It's a big ordeal. We're traveling, you know, 3,000 miles to, uh, to go surprise our parents. We didn't know what the reaction was going to be. I did bring you a birthday gift, though. <laughs> The kicker was two of my sisters being there, and that meant a lot to my dad. Two of them are the most amazing people on the planet. We mean that, we feel that, and, and they deserve this 100%. And I'm glad that we got to, to do this for him, because who knows? We were placing bets on whether or not he was going to cry or not. <laughs> Apart from surprising dad already and having that moment with him, the bonus is that we seem to have touched a lot of people with the video, and that almost means more. That is exactly what the moment is designed to show. How fantastic. I am a big fan, by the way, of those surprise visits, especially when you have to go far away to do that. Uh, my kids, by the way, did a fantastic thing for my 60th, but 
they live in Vancouver, so less drama on the travel, more drama on the back end. Um, that is, the, but that's all I'm saying. That is the national for December 9th. Join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio and CBC News Network, and later that night, right here for the national. Have a good night.